Welcome to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. On this podcast, we'll be discussing nonviolent readings of Latter-day Saint scripture. I'm Dan, and I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Marianne. The Latter-day Peace Studies Project is born out of a desire to proclaim peace by providing an opportunity to approach religion, scripture, and relationships with God in a peaceful way. As we develop peace within ourselves first, we can reflect peace into the world around us. The Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me podcast seeks to assist listeners in their approach to scripture by providing nonviolent interpretation. Our hope is that we can integrate the teachings of the scriptures into our efforts to find peace within ourselves and proclaim peace in the world. Welcome back to Latter-day Peace Studies. This week we are reading Healin 7 through 12. At least in Come Follow Me. We're not going to read it right now. It's uh, far too long. But uh, as usual, there is a lot in here. We get a mix of both, you know, sort of narrative story as well as Nephite history. Plus, we get kind of sermons from Nephi. And so it's got it's got a little mix of everything, no matter what uh, your preferred method of imbibing scripture is or your favorite scriptures. But it all starts with the return of Nephi from the land to the north, which we've talked about since the end of Alma. There's been these mass migrations towards this land of the north past Bountiful, both by ship and by land. And it seems like there's something up there. We've gotten a description of of some of these things. And so Nephi has gone to visit these people and has now returned after what has been a much less successful missionary journey than his journey from Bountiful all the way down south to the land of the first inheritance that we saw last week. And essentially, it's the same story among the Nephites back in Zarahemla that we've been seeing, where they just can't keep it together. And they're going to be spiritually beaten back into shape, and then they're just not going to keep up with it. And this cycle, I mean, when we talk about the Nephite pride cycle, you know, you might reference that a handful of times throughout Mosiah and Alma, especially, but I mean, right in these first few chapters of Helaman, it feels like they've just gone through it six or eight times already, just (laughs) constantly. It becomes less of a cycle and a little bit more of a merry-go-round. Yes, I, I think so. Although merry-go-rounds are just a smaller cycle. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an intensification, I would say, leading up to Christ's return. Yeah. That the period of the cycle has shrunk. And we get sort of the diagnosis, right, in verse 5. Some, some of the, well, I guess we get the symptoms by which you diagnose this, this corruption. We get the condemnation of the righteous because of their righteousness, letting the guilty and wicked go unpunished because of their money, held in office as the head of government to rule and do according to their wills, that they might get gain and glory of the world, that they might more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do it according to their own wills. Obviously, this is a very foreign concept to us, especially as Americans, you know, never have to worry about stuff like this. But it's it's interesting that Nephi has gone up to the north and in in the north, we know that there were some, you know, a- Ammonites, right? With some some of the people of Ammon who had gone up there, and so perhaps he, I like to think that there's still a righteous remnant up there. But among everyone else who's fled north now, it seems like he's just didn't have any success. They rejected all his words, and so he comes back to Zarahemla and he finds out that all of the work that he had done prior appears to have collapsed in his absence. And you can't really blame his absence on it, right? It's it's the Nephites. It's their choices. It's it's the things that they aren't doing. You know, we had the account of the Lamanites who were hunting down the Gadianton robbers and converting them to the church. But Nephite society, they just sort of let them hide in secret. We we talk about the Psalm of Nephi all the way back in, in Second Nephi, where he mourns about his personal failings and, oh, wretched man that I am, those those sorts of things. We get another one of those kind of many, many Psalms here with uh, Nephi, where he, he wishes that he were back in the land of Jerusalem, or at least back with Nephi when they came out of Jerusalem, when everyone was righteous and, and quick to listen to the Lord. So a bit of irony being, being brought up in here. I've noticed some of the themes that he talks about, something like this, like joy and righteousness, right? These are rewards of God. They're, they're personal things that we choose. Also, seems maybe like temple language and maybe a lack of the temple is what's driving some of this mourning. If the temple is no longer at the center of Nephite society, then 
uh, that people are not living up to that. They, we'll mention a little bit later some of the um, covenants, covenant penalties, trampling under feet. That we, we've talked about that before. That he's going to mention that again in this. But before we get to that, Nephi quite famously gets up on a tower. And it's a tower that's in his garden by the highway near the chief market uh, in, in Zarahemla, and he goes there to pray. Now, I'm not saying that this is for sure King Benjamin's old tower, but all I'm saying is we've only had one other mention of a tower in Zarahemla. Now, I know you disagree with me, Marianne, and I think you, you have plenty of ammunition on your side. I just don't think there's anything from the text to make, make the connection any more than it is a tower, to think that it's the same tower. I think they built Benjamin's tower quickly, I don't think it was a permanent fixture, especially after a hundred years or so. I also don't see it being the kind of thing that would be in just some guy's yard. I mean, I just... I find it insulting that you call Nephites some guy. Well, among among the rest of the Nephites, he is. I, I don't know. I, I find it implausible that it would be the same tower. However, it is clear that he is following this pattern here. So he has this tower in his garden. The reason he's up on the tower actually isn't to preach to the people. He's having a private moment with God. He's praying and he is lamenting the state of his people and and mourning. And he's not doing it for other people to hear just yet. And then his deep mourning attracts attention and curiosity from people passing by. And I think that that's why it tells us that it was by the highway, which led to the chief market to emphasize to us that that he is attracting random passers by that that's how this crowd comes to be gathered because they are curious they're trying to understand what's going on here which is just further evidence that nephites are human beings too you know a crowd will gather when they're just not quite sure what's going on and they're just going to wait around to figure out what's happening because they can't resist something that they're curious about so nephi takes this opportunity And begins to preach unto them, calls them to repentance, asks them to turn back to the Lord. Turn ye unto the Lord your God. Why has he forsaken you? It is because you have hardened your hearts. Yea, ye will not hearken unto the voice of the good shepherd. Yea, ye have provoked him to anger against you. So the condition of their hearts is going to be deadly to them is what is what he tells them i think you skipped over one of my favorite parts in 17 oh repent ye repent ye why will you die that to me is one of the more like incisive statements it's supposed to cut to their hearts this is not about like i just wish things were better so we could all be happier and everyone could be like remember how we were economically prosperous remember how great that was no he's he's worried about their spiritual condition right as you said their hearts the, these people are are dying before they die because they are dead to things of righteousness. And he he's giving them all these warnings and all of this. I mean, he's he's giving these great prophecies that of all these things that are going to be taken away and destroyed, and all of these things because of their aligning with the secret band, right? The of Gadianton, that this pride and that these things are in their hearts that they have seeped into the land itself, the land which Alma tried to bless. But ultimately, Alma even had prophesied of some of these same same things going to happen. And so we know what's going to happen, but God is trying to give them every single chance that they can to repent. He's, He's sending constant messengers. And we've got Nephi and Lehi, and they're going to mention other prophets coming, and we're going to have Samuel the Lamanite come. He's trying to give them a spokesman from any group so that maybe they will listen to one of them. But ultimately, you know what happens. And it's, I mean, it's frustrating. Reading these chapters is is incredibly frustrating when you know what happens, because there's so many things that you're just like, no, actually, that didn't fix all the problems. We're going to see a famine later, and they're in a famine for, what was it, four years, three years? three years. And you think, all right, well, they've learned their lesson, right? A three year long famine. Uh, clear, surely that, that has gotten it into their heads and they will repent and, and do the things that they need to do. But I mean, it's just a few short years after the famine that it pops up again, the Gadiat, the work of Gadiat and all these things. I noticed I, you know, it broad strokes. There are some 
similarities to what uh, Nephi says and what King Benjamin says. Obviously, King Benjamin is is doing it in a possibly a covenant renewal type of thing, whereas Nephi is essentially delivering the consequences of their failure to keep their covenants. So that might be a, a an interesting study to sort of parallel th- those two messages. We next get this. I, I I mean, again, it's like one of these little scenes, right? It's like its own self-contained story. And we get Nephi up on the tower and then people start accusing him. He goes in and he gives this, I mean, well, there's, there's a lot that happens right before that, but I don't know. Should we jump, should we jump to that? I, I would just say that real quick, as the people are contending against him, right? These are the judges who are, who belong to the secret band of Gadianton, who are crying and asking the people to go take care of them because what, what is he doing? He's talking badly against the law. And that should remind us of the scene with the lawyers in Ammonihah, where they were like, Amulek, you are preaching against the law, right? This is a crime. You're saying that the law is bad. And Amulek has to go and say, no, 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 it's not the law. It's actually you guys that, and that I'm preaching against. But Nephi, at this point, he's like, no, 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 it's the corruptness of your law, actually, because you are making changes to it. They fully corrupted the law. I think one other note that I have, and then I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts, because they cry to the people, and he talk, they talk about all these cities. He says they're, they're all going to be taken from us. But we know this is impossible because we're powerful. Our cities are great. Our enemy is going to have no power over us. Zarahemla has been conquered twice in recent memory. So what are they, <laughs> like, what are they thinking? I mean, yeah. is, is it delusion? Is it just... Being obstinate, I don't know what's driving that. Yeah, that that is difficult to reconcile. I I think they don't have any truth speakers among them, so they're just kind of relying on the people's pride of thinking that they're unconquerable. But them speaking to the people like this definitely reminded me of how the Book of Mormon describes many Nephite dissenters going to the Lamanites and stirring them up to anger. So mm-hmm. they are using incendiary language to promote violence. I think we have plenty of that in our own day as well. There are both politicians and political pundits who could argue that they're not being violent, but they're using platforms to stir people up to anger, incite violence. And we have seen that acted out many times just over the last few years. So we are definitely like the Nephites, able to be swayed by those people who are in power and what they, they can stand behind arguments that they didn't actually lift a finger, but we all know who's actually behind these with the Nephites. We all know that it's, that's these judges trying to incite the people to take care of Nephi. So they don't have to actually do it, but to the people's credit, the judges are afraid to do it outright because they know that if they're, if they're too obvious in their machinations, the people will get upset. So they have to be very careful. They are afraid of the people and they're compelled by their fear. So they durst not lay their hands on Nephi. And so Nephi is thinking, okay, I have, I have longer to get out my message and I can speak more in this, this later half of Helaman chapter eight, he gives this incredible sermon about prophesying of the coming of Jesus Christ. He invokes Moses. He invokes Abraham and says that they were called by the the order of God, yea, even after the order of his son. So very powerful language that should also remind us of Alma preaching in Ammonihah, prophesying of the coming of Christ. And to add to Moses and Abraham, he uses Zenus and Zenic and Isaiah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lehi and Nephi and he says, also almost all of our fathers, even down to this time, yea, they have testified of the coming of Christ and have looked forward and have rejoiced in his day, which is to come. And I love that he uses this beautiful reminder of their legacy, their ancestry, their whole cultural understanding comes from these people and these people testified of Christ. And so he's like, this, this is what everything is about. This is what they have all been pointing to. And this is why I'm prophesying to you because it's the point of everything. And it was so important for him to testify of the coming of Jesus Christ because that's exactly these bands of Gadianton were related to the order of Nehor in that they denied the coming of Christ and denied the resurrection. And so he's 
standing as a bold witness that the very central thing is that, yes, there is a Christ and yes, he is coming. I was struck by the fact that this is the fourth time that he, that a prophet in the Book of Mormon has used the story of the of the brass serpent that or, or the the brazen serpent in this case. This is the fourth mention. I mean, we have it in First Nephi seventeen, Second Nephi twenty five, and Alma thirty three. And each one of these times, it's talking about. I mean, Nephi and Lehi sort of focus on the history of God's dealing with uh, the Nephites. At least in First Nephi seventeen, it's it's sort of the history of how God has delivered them. And Second Nephi twenty five, it's a looking forward to Christ. Nama thirty three is another time where it's looking forward to Christ. And so this is just continuing that same theme about looking forward to God's deliverance based off a historical story. So again, we get here a remembering the past and imagining the future. And so these objects and symbols in the past help us create or imagine what the future condition might be. I think that that's an important sort of symbolic teaching here. We have Nephi preaching, right? And just as a little ancestral reminder, so Nephi is the son of Helaman. Who's the son of Helaman? Who's the son of Alma? Who is the son of Alma? So as Nephi's teaching and preaching these things, there are a lot of echoes of Alma, who is his great grandfather. I just want to remind us of how much time has passed here in the book of Alma, we have a lot of things happening in the short space of time, but in Helaman here, we have less happening in a, in a longer space of time. So just, just a reminder. So he has, he's preaching a lot of the same things that his great grandfather taught the people of Ammonihah. Also, I heard echoes of Alma's exchange with Korahor here in verse 24. I said the same thing in my notes. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing Ye know these things and cannot deny them except ye shall lie. Therefore in this ye have sinned, for ye have rejected all these things, notwithstanding so many evidences which ye have received. Yea, even ye have received all things, both things in heaven and all things which are in the earth, as a witness that they are true. But behold, ye have rejected the truth and rebelled against your holy God. So he's he's just reminding them of like, you are in this state because you have refused. Not because you don't know any better and not because you're ignorant. You have refused. So we get a good example here of the contrast of the Lamanites' sin of mostly being ignorant and not knowing in the several hundred years before this because their parents didn't teach them. But this is what active rejection of the gospel looks like. These are people who have had it preached to them, who understand it clearly, who have cultural support for following the commandments and living the law of Moses and looking forward to Christ and have decided they just don't want it. I have one more note in here just to say that we've talked a handful of times about this sort of maybe like conspiracy theory sort of aspect of the Book of Mormon where, you know, we keep mentioning like the kingmen and the people who want to get power, sort of the the two divisions in Nephite society where we, after they come to Zarahemla, where we have, you know, King Benjamin attempted to unite the people of Zarahemla and the people of Nephi. But even after that, we saw that there was not a total convergence, right? They didn't totally become one people. It didn't take very long, in fact, for those same things to start splitting up. And so there have been sort of hints or maybe things that have happened that could be explained by a remnant sort of competing royal claim. And so in verse 21, this is Nephi saying the sons of Zedekiah were not slain except from Mulek, and there are still the seed of Zedekiah with us. So there are still technically people who come from the royal line of Jerusalem who are in our group. So at least they're aware of those people. And now whether or not it's the case that they are part of the people who are causing issues for the Nephites, I can't say. Because a lot of it does seem Nephi self-inflicted. And so I don't totally think it's all, you know, all on essentially the people of Mulek. And the fact that we've never given them a proper name, we call them Mulekites, but the text never actually calls them Mulekites. People of Zarahemla might be the best idea, but by once you get several years in the future, it's sort of like, well, now everyone's the people of Zarahemla because they're all from there. So it's really, it's really hard to sort of identify this group because they don't technically have a name. But only this to say that all of this has led up to what I was actually trying to get at way back when, when I was talking, when we first started talking about eight, where we get this little kind of story, like this vignette almost of Nephi sort of dropping this big reveal that the chief judge is murdered. 
right? This was the third chief judge in like, I don't know, not that long. <laughs> he was only up in, in the Northlands for, you know, six or seven years, right? Yeah. And Cesorum and his son were both, it mentioned earlier in Helaman that Cesorum and his son were both murdered. In the same year. So I don't know how long it's been, but <laughs> these three chief judge murders have happened in a short amount of time. Nephi has been gone about six years. Yeah. So, yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't know how long Cesorum was uh, before Nephi left. So. Right. That's true. So are we ready for chapter nine then? I think so. This is this is one of those where it's like, this is a great story, and I don't have a ton to draw out of it. But I am grateful that we have the details of how this f- falls into place, because there are a lot of times where, in, in the Book of Mormon, where we just don't have details of how things happened. And I'm like, I'm so curious about that story. So I am grateful we have the details of the story. But I am wondering, this five that the group sends to go check and see if Nephi did indeed predict the murder of yet another of their chief judges, these five go, and as they go, they talk amongst themselves, and in chapter 9, verse 2, and they said, we will know of a surety whether this man be a prophet, and God hath commanded him to prophesy such marvelous things to us. So they don't believe at first, but then they say, but if, if this thing's true, then we will believe. And I'm just kind of wondering how, would we call this sign seeking? You know, I've, I go back and forth because I think what I come down on though, is we don't have evidence that they were asking for a sign, but when they heard that a sign was available, they went to go see it. I don't know about you, but I would probably go see it, right? Yes. It's like, okay, I have a chance. Hey, they have a seed. Uh, of the word, right, that Nephi's spoken. And now they're they're acting upon that seed. They don't know if the fruit is good or not. And they do say that they, it does sound like they kind of are sincere in that they have intentions to believe if it's true or it, like if they see that borne out instead yeah. of, you know, someone like Korahor who, who would explain away, even if they went there and he was dead, they would still find explanations as we find other people here do. This sign does not convince all of the people, but it does convince some. I mean, there are other people who are apparently, you know, I, I don't get the people who don't choose to go <laughs> because are they just like, well, there's no chance. I don't believe even that Nephi could do this thing. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they're just averse to blood. Like they're afraid to go. That sounds scary. I don't know. It does have, I, verse six, it feels like maybe there's a very tenuous connection between Amalekai and the Gadians because the judge is stabbed by you know, someone who he trusts in a garb of secrecy who then runs away. And then the servants go and, and tell the people raising the cry of murder. It just feels like, oh, this is kind of related, right? Maybe not strictly, I, I'm not saying there's any like genetic connection, but it's, I mean, how many times do you get people running away from a murdered leader? Well, it's definitely that under the garb of secrecy, like they're using the same methods, right? It's the same MO. I can't believe you skipped over in verse five that when these five see oh, yes. that he- that he has, that the chief judge has indeed been murdered. What do they do, Dan? They fall down. They one, fall to the earth. An, another one. <laughs> on, another on five the, bite uh, the dust. And, uh, yes. Uh, does this count as one or five, I guess, uh, in terms of our keeping track? I, I think it's all five. I think it's strange that all five of them have the same reaction. That does, to me, that does indicate that it is more cultural than, I don't know. I don't think that five people in our society would have this very same reaction, especially if that it was something like fainting. I don't know. <laughs> I I agree with you. It just anyway, it seems, so, seems unlikely. But Yeah. So they're unconscious. They're at the scene of the crime and they can't speak for themselves. And so it looks very bad for them. So they get thrown in prison. Yeah. Sorry. I did have a note because they get thrown in prison. And I know that we've had prison mentioned in Zarahemla before, but it just struck me like, oh yeah, like King Benjamin didn't have prisons. At yeah. some point, the Nephites decided they needed prisons. I have a feeling there are a lot of things that Benjamin and Mosiah tried to stamp out entirely that kind of crept their way back in quietly that we've not, you know, that aren't really 
spelled out in the text because they're not the focus, but probably contributed. Sorry for interrupting, but I only have one other thing to say because it has one of my favorite lines in the whole Book of Mormon. It's it's unintentionally, I think, one of the funniest lines in the Book of Mormon in verse 12 because they're asking, you know, okay, where were the five that were sent to inquire concerning the chief judge? And they said, well, concerning the five who you sent, we, we don't know anything about those guys, but we got the murderers and there's five of them right here. It's just, it's so comical. Like it almost seems like it could be like a sketch, right? right? Like from from like a, a sketch show, just like, well, I don't know what five you're talking about. We got these five right here. It's and like, they're the murderers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. But I do love that they can, they confirm, right, that those are the five who were sent. So they were indeed not the murderers, so they can speak for them. So they tell the people that Nephi definitely correctly predicted this, prophesied this. And a lot of the people think, they cry out and they say, behold, we know that this Nephi must have agreed with someone to slay the judge. And then he might declare it unto us that he might convert us unto his faith, that he might raise himself to be a great man chosen of God and a prophet. This is very much projection. These people who are surrounded by collusion and deceit to get gain and power and prestige, they see that everywhere. And so there is, they can see no motive for Nephi doing these things, except that he would do it to, that he did it on purpose to get power so that we would follow him. So that's the only language that they understand. That's what they're surrounded by in their culture. Everyone is deceitful. Everyone uses whatever means that they can get to get ahead. And so that must be what Nephi is doing. They can't grasp the, they can't believe that he would be prophesying because he loves them. Because he wants them to do better, because he wants to work for peace in their society. Like they just, they're having a really hard time understanding that. So this is definitely projection here where they're seeing all around them exactly what is in their own hearts. There's so much going on here too that I think is possibly just like, it almost feels like they're unintentionally participating and sort of a a ritual almost that's occurred before, because what are they doing with, with Nephi? They're bringing him to the multitude that they can cross him, that they can accuse him to death. That's what we saw with Abinadi. And that's what we saw with Alma. And then they literally pull out the same playbook that they, that, you know, Zeezrom used because they say, here's money. And if you tell us and, you know, acknowledge that this happened, we're, we're going to give it to you. And if you just confess, I mean, that's exactly what Zeezrom did back in Ammonihah. So, and then Nephi calls him out on it and then gives them another layer of, you know, go talk to his brother and you'll see all these evidences. And it does happen exactly how he, according to the words, he did deny. And also according to the words, he did confess. And so the five are set at liberty. So because they they caught the guy and they they have evidence here, then they they let the five go who witnessed it, I guess, (laughs) attested after the fact. And they let Nephi go. They have no reason to hold Nephi. This episode makes some people believe and some people don't believe. So it's far from being foolproof, which I think this is such a good case study in having a miracle and evidences does not create faith. It cannot create faith in people. Two people can witness the same thing and one person, it cannot have meaning to one person and to the other person it does. I think we also have here the first, maybe only indication that we've had influence of Lamanite religion on Nephi society. Because in verse 41, we get this, others who said, behold, he is a God for except he was a God, he could not have known all these things or could could not know of all things for behold, he has told us the thoughts of our hearts and has also told us th- told us things. And this sounds to me like some of the same language that Lamoni was using with Ammon and Ammon being able to discern that. And that appeared to be some influence of the Lamanite religion, potentially even the native religion that the Lamanites have sort of bought into. Because again, I subscribe to the theory that there were pre-existing cultures. And and so it's possible that the Lamanites had an intermingling with those. And that's where their religious society is. But that's one of the things that we haven't really ever seen. I mean, we've seen the Nephites, you know, both the apostate and, and true church Nephites go over and convert the Lamanites and teach them how, how to worship. And so we've seen that Lamanite religion, but we haven't really seen the other way around. We see a lot of like, oh, they're going to be lazy and slothful and idolatrous, but we don't get 
any other details about that. So that's just something I noticed because I remember thinking about that way back when and thinking like, how, okay, did the Lamanite religion ever impact Nephite society? And here's one verse that might indicate maybe yes. Yeah, there's this big ruckus, hullabaloo. I mean, I guess you could call it a lot of things, but here at the beginning of chapter 10, the crisis has passed or whatever. And so they all kind of go about and do their own things. And Nephi is left alone as he was standing in the midst of them. And so then he starts walking toward his own house and he's pondering upon the things which the Lord had shown unto him. He's thinking about and going over again, the revelation that he had probably thinking about its effect upon the people, probably hoping that some people had been convinced or heart softened and just going over this experience that probably happened pretty quickly, you know, within the course of a couple of days, he's processing here. And then the voice of the Lord comes to him. And we have this very meaningful statement from the Lord. I have beheld how thou hast with unwearyingness declared the word, which I have given unto thee, unto this people, and thou hast not feared them and hast not sought thine own life, but has sought my will and to keep my commandments. And then he blesses him, makes him mighty in word, deed, faith, and all works, and all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word, for thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. And then he says something that scholars of the scriptures say indicates that he's giving Nephi the sealing power here, and he recognizes Nephi by name. Behold, thou art Nephi, and I am God. Behold, I declare it unto thee in the presence of mine angels. And that recognition of name, saying Nephi's name and confirming his own in the presence of witnesses seems to be very ceremonial. And then he says he gives him power. Very specifically the sealing power. Yes, right? he does. He says that. Well, but I, I would add even more so how we understand the sealing power today as well. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Well, and then I think just to, I don't know why I've never put this together before, but he says, if ye shall say unto this temple, which by the way, we talked about where, where is the temple? Okay, the temple, which I imagine is probably empty and un, in disuse. If my if my understanding is correct, it shall be written twain because why not? It's not it's being been used. It's been desecrated it already. Done. And then what do you say? And if ye shall say unto this mountain, and what's a mountain? A mountain is another temple. Be thou cast down and become smooth. Whether you cut the temple in half or cast it down, you can do that. And so again, tying the same power with the power over the, the direction of the temple. And so it's possible that at some point in Nephite society, the temple had come into so much disuse that there weren't, there wasn't anybody who could go officiate in there, who could go run the temple duties. That's so heartbreaking. And we would typically think that if they're following in the pattern of Moses, that the things that they would be doing would be sacrifices, you know, those sorts of things. But it's clear that God is giving Nephi some power beyond just that, beyond just sort of, sort of the external ad, administrative sort of, here's the sacrifices. We're going to make sure that we're, you know, joining on every holiday and offering the right amount of things. It, I mean, this seems quite different because it almost seems like he's saying, don't worry about the temple because we got the one up in Bountiful and that's going to have to do for now. Well, and he, he tells Nephi, go and declare unto this people. He gives him a commandment to go and keep preaching and Nephi stops like where he is and he doesn't go home he turns right around and goes back to the crowds of people to preach that is immediate obedience if I've ever seen it <laughs> and I also love it because so often in the scriptures we there are definitely exceptions to this obvious exceptions but we get sort of like the general and Nephi did preach unto the people all his days or you know like we we get sort of broad brush of their actions very rarely do we get this happened this day and he chose that moment do you know what i'm saying like it's it's yeah more the exception than the rule that we get something this specific about what he does in that moment so yeah i just i just thought that was a great example of exact and immediate obedience he goes and he returns to the multitudes who were scattered about upon the face of the land and began to declare unto them. So that also to me indicates like a longer period of time too, right? He goes directly to people, but then he just starts talking to everybody because that is his calling now. And that's just what he, maybe he becomes nomadic. Like maybe he just kind of becomes this traveling prophet, which he had done before, but even more so now, like he's, he feels the urgency. I, it has to be a long period of time because 
he gets back in the 60 and ninth year. And then in verse 19 is the end of the 70 and first year. So it definitely is some time. What I notice is that among these things in verse 13, they did harden their hearts In verse 15, they did hard. They did still harden their hearts. And then in verse 18, they would not, not hearken unto his words. So we've got three total rejections here that they're specifically calling out, which seems to be an important pattern that the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you three chances, essentially three strikes and you're out because what happens next? Contentions increase, and Nephi says, "Okay, the Lord trusts me to use this." At, at some point, you know, the Lord even said that this would, you know, be be sort of under His purview, and so He goes and and prays for a famine in the land to stir them up into remembrance of the Lord, that perhaps they can repent. This is the first time. I mean, famine and war happen so often in sort of history. So this is interesting that this is the first time that we've seen it in the Book of Mormon. We did have resource issues and supply chain issues during the Amalekiah Wars, but this this is the first time that I've noticed that this this is like taking place in Book of Mormon history. So the the seventy and second year is when there begin to be wars throughout the land, and then in the seventy and fourth is when Nephi asks the Lord to replace the war with famine, and they have a famine for a good three years until the 70 and sixth year when Nephi sees that the people have repented and humbled themselves. And then he cries to the Lord to get this lifted. Now, I guess it's not really very Christian to question someone else's repentance. Only an individual can know whether they have truly repented in their heart. But it's very difficult to believe these people's repentance because within six years, the band of Gadianton is already is back up and running again. They have... They have six years where they repent and the famine ends and they prosper and people join the church. And then about four years after that kind of happens, they're all wicked. Well, I I wouldn't say all. They turn back to their wickedness and the band of Gadianton becomes exceedingly great. And they become so big that they threaten the existence of the rest of the people who live in that area. I noticed one other Oh, I noticed a lot, but one other thing that stuck out to me in verse eight of chapter 11 is that the people plead with the chief judges and leaders. And when they're going to Nephi to ask him to lift this famine. And it kind of made me think about at the end of Benjamin's sermon, how we have the group of people all with one voice, you know, calling to Benjamin and saying, yes, we, we want to live this way. And so again, you can choose to be humble or you can be compelled to be humble. And maybe the reason that it's better to choose to be humble than to be compelled is that the compelling doesn't last as long. It's challenging because if you say like this famine is coming from the Lord, from Nephi, then you have to, you have to ask yourself, okay, so is Nephi taking responsibility for the deaths of, because guess what? Famine is going to affect the righteous, right? We get no indication that the righteous are spared from all of this. Well, and famine, I mean, just speaking from an anthropological perspective, famine mostly kills children. They are disproportionately affected because malnutrition kills them faster than most adults. So yeah, the the vulnerable people would be most affected by a a famine. I think that's one of those things that's challenging. Is, Is this really something that the Lord will use? Is this something that you'd be willing to use? I don't know that I would be. Well, war often leads to famine because war leads to destruction of lands where people plant and harvest and raise animals and and all of that, how people raise food. So the land and resources are destroyed. And then if there's extended war, you're losing people. So maybe the resources are there, but you don't have the people to harvest them or or move them or process them or whatever else is required. And maybe the people saw the famine as the Lord inflicting punishment when perhaps it could more accurately be described as a natural consequence of the wars. And so when he prays for this famine, perhaps part of that prayer because we only get one verse of that prayer. We get six verses of him praying to lift, but perhaps part of the the prayer to inflict is rather, you know, asking for sort of the natural consequences of the things that have happened to be allowed to happen, to not have some of the protections potentially. That's one of the things that I think is, is 
parents that we we find, you know, the sort of natural consequences actually work really well for teaching people, for teaching our kids. It's like imposing external consequences sometimes fails because if the behavior isn't going to bring those consequences, then you're, you aren't teaching them properly. You're, you're sort of saying, well, yeah, that's, you know, you can actually do this. And the only way that it's bad is I have to do something about it, right? Which requires me to be there and me to be active. Right. It's only bad because yeah. I say arbitrary. And then for Nephi to then have to sort of offer six times the amount of, of prayer verses to lift perhaps is is indicative of praying for healing because asking for a famine, if it's if this is fallout from natural consequences, is just sort of saying, let things keep going as they are going. Whereas this, now he has to fight all this entropy, all this that has been introduced into the system after three years of famine. And so it takes a lot more to dig yourself out of that hole than it does to find a hole to fall in. In the 80th year, as we talked about, there were dissenters from the people of Nephi who had some years before gone over into the Lamanites and taking upon themselves the name of Lamanites, and also a certain number who were real descendants of Lamanites being stirred up to anger by them or by those dissenters. Therefore, they commenced a war with their brethren. So we're back to some war. And this comes from this this great band of robbers who search out all the secret plans of Gadian, and thus they became robbers of Gadian. Now, Nephi had claimed back in verse 10 that the people repented and swept away the band of Gadianton from amongst them insomuch that they have become extinct and they have concealed their secret plans in the earth. And that was in the year, the 75th year of the reign of the judges. And we're only in the 80th year. So I just find it hard to believe that in these five years, they completely disappeared and then reappeared. I think they just went underground. I think we're not even talking a separate generation here. We're talking all the same people who were involved in the ba band of Gadiantans five years ago. Just bring back their plans. They don't even have to teach anybody new. <laughs> they just get the club back together. And they, they leave Nephite society and they infest the mountains and the wilderness, which is kind of new. Even the Nephites just lived in their own civilization. And we, ha we hadn't gotten a lot of mention of mountains before, a lot of hills, but these these are up in the mountains and in the wilderness. And so they can't really be attacked. They're difficult to pin down. I guess you could sort of say some like guerrilla warfare type of thing. And so the people in Zarahemla and, you know, surrounding cities and villages or whatever become sitting ducks for this roving band who have no scruples. And life gets very, very difficult for everyone there. But they grow stronger in their wickedness. And, and they just, Nephi continues to tell us that they, well, I guess you could say Mormon is telling us here that they, they continue to sink and they don't repent and they don't mend their ways. And chapter 12, the majority of chapter 12 is Mormon giving us a very big, and thus we see, summary of, of what we've been witnessing here. So in reading the Oxford Annotated Edition by, by Grant Hardy, one of the things that I think it's him who, who brings this out is that Helaman 12 has some parallels between uh, with, with Deuteronomy 32, with the Song of Moses, where you know they, they get this pattern of accusation and then recital of God's blessings, condemnation of betrayal, assertion of divine power and authority, and then reaffirmation of God's compassion and commitment to his people, which I think is really interesting because I can't remember. He, he claims that Mos the Song of Moses is a later editorial edition, which I think is correct based off what I know, but that also the Song of Moses actually draws on maybe earlier traditions written in this form and that it actually might be like, a, a you know, adapted from an earlier sort of Canaanite poem. And so that to me is, is very interesting. But if Mormons got all these plates, including the brass plates, it's possible that the Song of Moses was on the brass plates. So he may have purposely structured it yeah. that way. Yeah, or a pattern yeah. of it. Yeah. Or Joseph Smith, as he's translating, he's familiar with the Bible. And so as he's translating, perhaps he's following some of those same patterns that he is aware of. Whatever your translation beliefs are, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to see parallels between like even large parallels or even direct quotations. <laughs> so in verse 2, this is where they, they mention that trampling under their feet, the Holy One, which is the covenant penalty. So it's interesting that he brings it up here, uh, even though this is sort of, this would be the people imposing that covenant penalty on Christ. But it's, I think it's showing 
how far gone they are, that they're willing to essentially abandon their covenants. Right. So the covenant would have been that if we don't keep our end of it, may we be trampled under feet like this rent garment. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. And so instead of them, because they're not keeping this covenant, instead of them willing to be trampled, they're trampling Christ. Exactly. Which is exact, I mean, which is his... His role, that is what he takes upon himself as the mediator. Yeah. Well, our, our punishment, the scapegoat being inflicted upon him. So I really just love this whole chapter is, is very wonderful and a great reminder. I love that it follows sort of like a psalm or like you were saying that the song of Moses of just expressing worship, a worshipful attitude toward God and a recognition of his blessings and power. And then the human frustration with our own frailties and with our own inconstancy to God. But I, I do love in verse 22 at the very end when, when he says, therefore for this cause that men might be saved hath repentance been declared. So that's the whole point of repentance is so that he can save us. It's not so that he can belittle us or make himself feel important or, make us feel like we don't matter. Repentance is so he can save us because we're worth saving. We might lose it in all of the intense Old Testament language, but I think that is so beautiful and loving that the Lord reminds us, or rather the Lord reminds us through Mormon, that repentance is a joyful message. Repentance is our salvation. Repentance is saving us. And it's the it's the good news that the Lord finds us worth saving and that we don't have to stay where we are. Yeah, I had to look up the reference, but Second Peter three nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which I think is exactly the sentiment that Mormon is putting here. May God grant in his great fullness that men might be brought unto repentance and good works that they may be restored unto grace for grace according to their works. And I would that all men might be saved. So almost an exact you know, parallel with, with the, that same idea. That's all for this week. We want to thank our editors for their hard work. Please make sure you rate and review the podcast on your podcast platform of choice and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode and share with your friends about our discussions. If you'd like to get involved in the Latter-day Peace Studies Project, you can join our Facebook group, Latter-day Nonviolence Passive Visible Peace Studies. We've got links in the show notes. Make sure to go to our website, latterdaypeacestudies.org, and check the Get Involved page to see how you can contribute regularly to help cover the cost of hosting or contribute your talents to podcast editing. We are always in need of people who can help share that editing burden. For Latter-day Peace Studies, I'm Dan. And I'm Marianne. Thank you. <laughs>